Okay, so good morning and uh, thank you for having the opportunity to talk to you about uh, uh, 4K and, and H.265. So I'm going to spend the next uh, 20 minutes or so talking a little bit about the motivation. Why did we create this startup? What is the vision that we see for video collaboration in the future? And then how are we actually implementing some of the real challenges of building an H.265 encoder? So a lot of people kind of ask, well, why did we form this startup that's called NG Codec? Why, why did we do that? Why did we quit our day jobs, decide to not get paid for 18 months to build this new video encoder? And we fought long and hard about it. But the real motivation for me is that, I'm sorry to say, but video sucks right now. I mean, yeah, it's got better, but I see so much frustration of just trying to watch video on the internet. Whether it's YouTube or other places, it's buffering, it breaks up. But even if you get beyond that, I still feel that the experience that we offer today is nothing like real life. And I feel we've got a long, long way to go. And my vision for creating this company is the holodeck, if you're familiar with Star Trek. You should not be able to tell the difference between a real meeting and a video meeting. It should be seamless, just as it is in Star Trek. Now, that's the vision that I believe we can help to contribute. And I think we're going to get there. It's an incredibly high bar. But I think it's the bar that we should set ourselves, because it is achievable. Now, it may take over 20 years, but the ultimate goal for why we formed NG Codec is about realism. We want the video experience to be so real that you don't even know that it's synthetic, that it's coming over a network. And I believe that is the goal that we should set ourselves as an industry, as a collaboration to achieve. And I think it is achievable. And you'll see that I'm going to show how in the life of this new standard, H.265, over the next 10 years, I think we're going to get quite close. We may not get yet to the holodeck. That may be, as Thomas mentioned, H.266 that takes us there. But I think we can get quite a bit closer than we are right now. So let's, let's talk a little bit about what are the metrics for measuring quality or the experience or how it can be immersive? You know, what would get us close to that holodeck experience? So resolution is a big part of it. And you've heard and I think you've seen we are in a transition. Just as we transferred from standard definition to HD, we're in the transition to Ultra HD or 4K or 2160p. But that's just part of the transition. There are people like in Japan that are pushing 8K. And I believe that ultimately for the vision of the holodeck, it's probably going to be 16K or even more. But resolution is important, and we are moving forward. But it's not the only characteristic that defines the video experience. So let's talk about some of the other components that also define the video experience. Colorometry is extremely important. And as you can see on this graph, the tongue, as I refer to it, is the range of visible colors that a human can perceive. Now, the problem today is that no camera and no display can actually resolve that range of colors. And so historically, we have defined a subset we call a gamut, which is a smaller range of colors. And you can see that over time, that triangle in the middle has been expanded. And right now with 4K, we're referring to recommendation BD2020, which has a much wider gamut. And that's a good part of the experience. But also related to that is, is HD and dynamic range. And one of the, the challenges with the newer TVs is that they have a wider gamut, but that means that the quantization noise between the levels becomes uh, magnified. And so if you use eight bits to represent the colors and you have a much wider gamut, you end up with banding. As you can see 
uh, on the picture on, on the diagram there. And that's why the recommendation is for 4K, you must use uh, 10 bits. And that's why we as NG Codec championed and were successful in getting the industry to adopt a main 10 profile for Ultra HD. For 1080p content, I think it's optional. Some people will go there and some won't. But it's a very important part of the equation. We also, I'd like to mention high dynamic range. Displays are getting brighter, much brighter. And so, again, you need more bits to represent that. I mean, if you look in this room, the display at the back is much less bright than displays at the front. And with the newer technologies, displays get so much brighter. So again, if you want to represent high dynamic range, more like reality, you need more bits. Uh, there's also a move towards a different color space, the XYZ, that actually can represent everything instead of subsetting it. And that's also some work that's going on in the industry. So I've talked about resolution, and I've talked about colorometry, but there's more. I would say things like high frame rate are also quite important. We are seeing that for a lot of motion, the high frame rate gives a lot of fidelity. It's maybe more important for sports than video collaboration. But there's another side to high frame rate, and that is reality. If you have a high frame rate, images become much more realistic. Because in real life, we don't see 10 frames or 30 frames or 60 frames a second. We actually see a constant flow of images into our eyes. And so the higher the frame rate, the more realistic video becomes. And there's been a lot of research by the BBC and the EBU and others on this. And I would encourage you to, to look at that. Second component is latency. Now, if we're talking about a collaboration, latency is really crucial. Obviously, you must have uh, lip sync. But even beyond that, it makes it much more realistic the lower the latency. And again, a lot of work that we did and others in the standard is to improve the latency. In, in H.265, we now have a formalized math method to communicate the buffering model so that the decoder can't add additional latency because it's buffering. And that's something that previously we had to do in a proprietary manner. Color, um, 3D. I think 3D is going to come back. As, as with Thomas, I believe if you talk about reality, 3D is what we see. We have two eyes. We see in stereoscopic. But I think the glasses just don't work. Nobody wants to wear them. Maybe people will wear them at the movies, but they won't wear them for general collaboration. But there are technologies coming together that allow you to do stereoscopic without glasses. But they typically rely on multi-view. You've got to have multiple videos encoded and deliver one for each standing position. But I think that's absolutely going to come. And again, it's part of the realism. And then it's field of view, the immersive experience. You know, when I look here, I have approximately a 200 degree field of view. I can move my head. I can move my eyes. I can see everybody in the room. That's how life is. And so there's a, a startup company that, that is using some of our previous generation technology, uh, the Panacast. They have a, a 200 degree panoramic view, which I've shown on this image. And I think that's what you want. You want an immersive display that's very, very large, that has a, a wide field of view that represents precisely what you would see. I personally don't believe you should go wider than 200. I think when you start to see some of the 300, 360 degrees, it becomes very awkward. We're not used to seeing behind us at the same time. But 200 degrees, when you use it, I think it becomes very realistic. And I think it's a very important part of the collaboration experience. But all of this generates bits. And in fact, if you put all of that together, it could be in the gigabits or even higher. And so codecs are fundamental because you have to compress this data. There is just so much data that if you want to communicate it to anybody, compression is essential. And we've had many, many generations of, of standards. The, the great thing is that the latest standard, H.265, is achieving around a 200 to 1 reduction. Imagine that, 200 times smaller. It's phenomenal. 
And, and, and so, you know, I would say we, we owe a lot of gratitude to all of those engineers that worked incredibly diligently to come up with this new standard. You saw from the previous speaker the sheer intellectual effort that went into this standard. And it's delivering phenomenal results. And we fully believe that just as 50% of the bits on the internet today are in 264, the same is going to be the case for 265 going forward. It's got phenomenal traction for a standard that was only ratified uh, six months ago. So what I'd like to do now is, is, is play a very short video. This is a, a, a three-minute video that really describes some of the future use cases that I think H.265 will deliver. So this video, unlike my holodeck, which is 20 plus years out, I would say this is five to 10 years. So this is kind of showing some different scenarios, including right at the end, you'll see a video collaboration experiment that's actually happening. And, and I may provide a bit of commentary, but there is also some audio. So let's, let's, let's start the video. So the underlying theme is that displays are everywhere. Walls, every flat surface becomes a display in the future. So here we have a video call going on. But also he's interacting, he's doing work with the display in the office. Again, the table is now also a display talking to his mobile or her mobile, and she's actually interacting with the table. This is now more in the home. You can see the fridge is a display. It's playing back video content that had previously been captured. Now we have a, a FaceTime, a video call coming in. It starts on the mobile, but then it transitions to the display on the table. This is now a classroom experience where we're, we're in at school and again the whole wall is a display and the display is working with the tablets that the students are using and the two are talking to each other and interacting. This is my favorite example. This is augmented reality. This is a huge display in a national park that's augmenting information. For instance, a dinosaur. I think this is gonna make learning and entertainment just amazing as we augment reality onto our displays. And then of course we can take it home and share. The final example, I think, is video collaboration at the next level. This is a video call, but can you tell it's a video call? The whole wall is the display. These two doctors are in different parts of the planet, and they are interacting seamlessly, as if they were in the same room. I think this is the real vision for the future of collaboration, and I believe this is within 10 years we can do this, and we will do it with H.265. Okay, so I'd li now like to start to the next topic of my uh, presentation, which is more about the challenges of actually building a hardware encoder. So I'd start, start by comparing uh, two scenarios. Today, you might be doing a video collaboration using H.264, and you might be doing uh, 1080p30. And that's probably state-of-the-art today. It's what many of you have as products and use on a daily basis. But let's imagine that we now roll forward and you want to do a 4K solution, but using H.265. Now, obviously, from 4K 
to 1080p is a four times increase in pixels. So we've got a 4x complexity in just a number of pixels. Next, we're going to 60 frames a second versus 30 because it's more re realistic. So that's a doubling in complexity. Thirdly, we're going from 8-bit color depths to 10-bit color depths. So that's a 25% increase in complexity. And finally, we're moving from 264 to 265. But of course, we're trying to do this in a cost-effective manner. So we're building something that's maybe about 4x the complexity. So if you add all of this together, and this is, I think, a very realistic scenario, what you're talking about is a 40x increase in complexity with a combination of higher resolution, higher bit depths, higher frame rates, and 264 versus 265. So how to build that into hardware? That's, that's a very realistic goal that I think we can deliver within the next year or so. So for us, our encoder is designed specifically for an FPGA chip and then later for an ASIC. So this, this design is, is optimized uh, for uh, low latency and we use four engines internally and we use a, a new technique in the standard called WPP, which allows us to do uh, wavefront parallel processing. It's a new parallelism tool that allows us to combine those four engines together to do 4K. Uh, one of the benefits of this new standard uh, and WPP is that you don't lose the compression efficiency that historically tiles had. So you can still have uh, very, very high compression, but even though you are, are using a parallelism tool. Uh, a second challenge with the new standard is how you do uh, the block partitioning. Uh, as, as, as Thomas outlined, we have a, a coding tree unit that can be hieratically divided down into smaller coding units and how you actually make those decisions to break the design into the smaller blocks is, is, is very, very challenging. Um, it's very important for visual quality to be able to, to do that. So the way that we solve this problem is that we have a two-stage refinement. So we have a first stage where we do course level mode selection and block partitioning, and then we refine that selection on a final stage of our, our design. And, and that's partly how we're able to, to deal with that. In addition, we have a, a large number of very small microprocessors inside our encoder that give us a lot of ability to customize and tune how the algorithms actually work. The heavy lifting is done by the hardware itself, but the, the decisions are done by C firmware that runs on, on our microprocessor. The, the third challenge is the uh, intra-prediction. It's now vastly more complex in, in H.265. Uh, we have something like 33 directions uh, plus the averaging and plus the planar modes, so 35 different modes versus uh, H.264. So significantly more, more complex. Uh, again, we achieve this by using high-level parallelism. In a hardware design, we can do a lot of things in, in parallel. Uh, but we also have uh, very sophisticated uh, decision-making utilizing a number of the microprocessors. And again, we do the two-stage refinement such that we can do some of the decisions in the early stage of the pipeline and then refine it as we continue the work. Uh, one of the options could have been to not implement all of this complexity and only do a subset. But we felt that it's very important to achieve the high performance goal that, that H.265 can achieve is that we implement everything. And again, we have to be very, very smart. In the past, you could do a brute force approach of doing everything, but with the new standard, it's not feasible, even in hardware, to do a brute force approach. So uh, a couple more slides. Uh, what about imagining this 4K scenario, it's a video collaboration, um, what are the choices that you would have to implement? You know, one choice is that you could decide that, well, actually, I'm going to use a PC. The problem is, it's very computational enhanced. It, you know, trying to encode and decode 265 on today's PCs without hardware acceleration would mean that it would probably, you would struggle to get more than standard definition. You know, it's very, very, very tough. 
So you're probably going to get 480p, given the fact that you've got to decode this video stream as well. And, and so our preferred approach is to use a very cost-effective FPGA that only costs a relatively small amount. And now, in real time, you can do full HD and 4K uh, with no loss of quality or, or latency. And we think that's a really night and day approach. And so until you start seeing hardware support for H.265 in the Intel chips, uh, it's, we feel, not feasible to do 4K in software. And we think it's going to be many years, if we look at the Haas, we'll de see decoding first, but hardware encoding in Intel chips, we think, is probably four or five years away. So my last slide to, to, to conclude. Uh, HEVC is extremely challenging, but it is achieving its goal, and it will become the dominant standard. It has all of the players behind it. Uh, hardware encoders are challenging. Right now, what most people are showing are software encoders. But software encoding, we think, is not practical for many markets. Uh, at the IBC show, I saw a 4K encoder. It used 64 Intel i7s to do a, a 4K30 at half a kilowatt of power. That's something that we can do in a very small chip uh, for a fraction of that budget. But even trying to do that on today's PCs, until we start to see hardware support, we don't think it's practical. 4K is coming. That's my final conclusion. Uh, 4K, you know, this TV on, on, the, on, on the display uh, is available on Amazon for less than $1,000. That's a 4K TV, 50 inch. Uh, 4K market is happening, uh, and it's happening very quickly. So thank you for your time. Um, you can scan the QR codes or go to our website, and you can download uh, a PDF of these slides, in including the video. Thank you very much.